Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we are doing a deck tech for Riku of the Many Paths. Riku is a Tamur 3-3 human wizard, and this big wall of text says, whenever you cast a modal spell, choose up to X, where X is the number of times you chose a mode for that spell. And then you get to pick from exile the top card of your deck, and you can play it until the end of your next turn. Uh, put a 1-1 counter on Riku, and he gains trample until end of turn. Or you make a 1-1 blue bird creature token with flying. So this is just some charming modal Riku. So why play Riku, right? Just because modal spells span across multiple sets with a huge selection of them just to choose from. So we have so many different options of how we want to build this deck just because there are so many charms, there are so many modal spells, so many pick two if you have your commander, pick both or whatever, right? So many. Tamur also offers the best color support for spell singing, in my opinion, is it's pretty good. But Tamur just adds the green, you get the Simic stuff, it's real good. Um, and then also just multiple ways to play Riku as a commander, just because you just get to choose what makes sense. Let's say you need card draw, you exile the top card. Say you need a big body, you want to win with commander damage, sure, put a counter on Riku when he's annoying to block. Or you just make a bird just to attack with later. I like the bottom option and that's kind of what we're going to focus on, right? So the deck doesn't need Riku to win, right? Having him is good. It basically gives us an extra payoff mode for our modal spells. Um, but you don't, we don't really need them to win the game. So early game, we're going to want to ramp and play some small creatures and token generators um, just for value, right? Then mid game, we're going to want to play Riku and start casting our modal spells to make tokens with the bird. Slam counters on Riku to make them bigger. A bunch of different ideas we could do. And then late game and the way we will be winning is just by making a lot of tokens, just because we're going to be casting a lot of instants and sorceries. So we have all of those guys that are like, oh, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, you make a guy. Riku's also just one of those guys now because all of our spells come with a free bird. So late game, we're going to swing out with all our tokens that we get from having a big board state. Here are the vulnerabilities. Board wipes, just like Wrath of God. We're at the end of the day, we're like a token spell slinging deck, right? So we don't want our to creatures to die. And then we have those stacks or once a turn kind of effects like Thalia and Deafening Silence. Just because we don't want all of our spells to cost more, you know, that's really going to slow us down a lot. And only playing one a turn is also not great for us either. So just channel stuff. Uh, the deck cost about 390 at the making of the video. I know that's inflated just because the website I'm using, the Moxfield list, has Riku at like $20 and all of the other cards from Outlaws of Thunder Junction at like 15 or so dollars. They're going to hard plummet once the deck actually comes out. So really consider this deck to be like 300 even. And if you like it, get the cards you need from the link below. It helps me out. And remember to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Coming into it, right? We have Archmage Emeritus, 4 minute 2-2. Two, two. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery, draw a card. We're an instant or sorcery deck. We want to draw a lot of cards. Balmore's nice just because he's an easy way to help us win fast since we are also a token deck. Spell swinging tokens, right? Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, creatures you control get plus 1, plus 0, oh, and trample until end of turn. That can make all of our guys go kind of nuts. Baral Chief of Compliance is one I typically don't add into spell singing decks like this. Um, it's just because of the modal. He makes our instants and sorceries cost one less to cast for two mana, which is already really good. And then whenever a spell you control counters a spell, you may draw a card if you do discard a card. We have a lot of counter spells in this deck, right? It just how so happens that a lot of the charms, a lot of the counter spells, not counter spells, a lot of the modal spells have counters built into them. So Baral can actually help us... Um, draw off of our counters with that crater hook behemoth is the classic staple token card when he enters the battlefield creatures get huge he basically says the game is over right i'm sure any of you that have gone against a crater hoof very rarely is a player not dead or is the game still going on right goblin anarchomancer and a goblin electromancer basically the same thing first goblin makes our green and red spells cost one less electromancer makes our instants and sorceries cost one less just cost reducers really to help us keep going Gutter Snipe, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, he deals two damage to each opponent. Um, we are an instant or sorcery and token deck, so we do a lot of them, right? So basically just hitting everyone for two per spell is real good. Helps them get to a lower life total, so we don't have to do too, too much work with the tokens. Harmonic Prodigy, Prowess. If an ability of a shaman or another wizard you control triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. Let's look at Gutter Snipe and Murmuring Mystic. Murmuring Mystic says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, you make a 1-1 one, one blue creature illusion. You know, you make a bird, right? Harmonic Prodigy, since he is a wizard, will copy that. So whenever we cast an instant or sorcery, we get two guys. 
Um, Gutter Snipe, we're now dealing four damage. Harmonic Prodigy is very good in this deck because we are running very few non-wizard or shaman. Let's go actually back for a second, right? Wizard, 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 beast, shaman, wizard. Beast, I mean, he's going to win the game anyway. We don't run a ton of guys that aren't shamans or wizards. Of course, we talk about the other two guys that aren't shamans or wizards. We have Ojer, uh, Pack to Peak, whatever, Deepest Deepak, doesn't matter. We're just running him because whenever you cast an instant or sorcery uh, from your hand, it gets rebound, which means we can exile it and then cast it for free on our upkeep, um, which is good just because it lets us essentially two for one all of our spells. And then when he dies, he turns into this land. Don't really worry about the land. We're really just using him just for the first part, the instant or sorcery rebound. Obika, Enigma, Goliath. Hot take, I like the Phyrexian frame. A lot of people don't like the Phyrexian, like white background, like ink. For, I like it. I think it's pretty cool. Anyway, 7 minus 6, 6 Phyrexian Nightmare. Flying, Ward 3, Pay 3, Light. That's basically hex proof. Whenever you cast a non creature spell, make X 1 1 goblins, um, or X is a spell's mana value, and they get haste. It's a great token generator. It's a great way to just beat down. Roaming Throne, we're probably going to say Wizard, right? Just because our commander is a wizard. Um, and we'll have Riku double up, so then whenever we cast an instant or sorcery, we will get, um, you know, just two of the... Mo really, we just we want to double up on all the modes we get. It's also nice because picking Shaman is also a viable option, because you have cards like Stormkiln Artist, you know, you love them. Whenever you ca cast or copy an instant or sorcery and make a treasure, um, we can double up on those effects. So when he enters, you don't have to do Wizard. Shaman is also a fine example. It really depends where you're at, right? But before we skip over, Seedborn Muse. Untap all permanents you control during each other player's untap step, right? The main reason, we just want to untap. So since we are a spell singing deck, uh, token generate, whatever you want to call it, guys, it doesn't really matter. We want our lands to be untapped. We So we have like 20-something sorceries, like or not sorceries, instants. We have like almost 30 instants in this deck. Um, so being able to, you know, pump them out all the time, is great we don't have to worry about tapping down on our turn from doing our sorceries or playing our creatures it's good talrand and iron class are basically the same thing it's whenever you cast a non-creature an instant or sorcery for talrand you make a drake or you make a 1-1 soldier really just guys to make tokens to beat down with veyran's great because whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery he'll get plus one plus it doesn't matter until in the turn it's basic with prowess um but if casting or copying an instant or sorcery causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. L using Talrand and um, Third Path Iron Iron Iconoclast, bleh. As examples, we're just going to double up on tokens, right? We're going to double up on Riku's abilities. Archmage Emeritus is going to double up on draw. It's going to double up on pretty much everything. He's a doubler. That's what he does. And then the final creature is Young Peasy. Whenever you cast an inner sorcery, you gotta get a, you get a guy. No big deal. Good token generation. So going into sorceries, a lot of it is just ramp. We have cultivate just for, you know, get one to the field, one to your hand. Far seek just to get a triumph or a shock land. Um, fiery confluence is the first real modal spell we'll talk about. Choose three. You may choose the same mode more than once. Deal one damage to each creature. Deal two damage to each opponent or destroy a target artifact. So the thing that's great about these modal spells is Riku like hits he triggers per one you cast so let's say we choose to do one of each right then we're going to get a bird riku's going to get a counter and then we're going to impulse draw the top card of our library if we do let's say we just feeling stupid you know and it's not even a bad idea either so it's not stupid if we just pay four mana to deal essentially six damage to each opponent we're only getting one trigger because we only chose one mode so again really the whole idea with this deck is just to choose as many options as we can uh just to have riku proc a bunch and we just outvalue passively and make a bunch of tokens passively just for getting good effects hole breach choose one destroy target artifact destroy target enchantment destroy target artifact and enchantment ideally we're just going to do the bottom one right so this one although we're not going to be able to choose both modes again just having hole breach and getting a free bird or a free counter on riku or a free impulse draw off riku is really really good right uh jessica's will if we have riku do both um so that's going to get us two triggers off riku you guys understand how it goes jessica's will it's going to get us a lot of mana exile the top three cards of our deck we can play them this turn jessica's will you know it you love it you really hate it you don't love it well, you love it when you play it. Um, but yeah, we do a lot of copying in this deck, believe it or not. 
um, just with some stuff. So Jessica's Will is pretty easy to go uh, infinite with just red. Uh, not infinite, but very, very close to. Kodama's Reach is basically just Cultivate. Mizzix's Mastery. Um, exile a target card that's an instant or source from your graveyard, um, or you can overload it, right? It's pretty good. Usually when a Mizzix Mastery resolves, the game is over. It's pretty much the game is over. Um, you just play every instant or sorcery from your grave for eight mana. It's great. Uh, Nature's Lore, search your deck for a Shockland or a Triumph or just a regular old forest. That's fine too. And then Plain White Celebration I like uh, because you get to choose four of them. It's actually the only one where uh, you get all of Riku's abilities and there's not enough to cast because there is no choose four. And you can choose the same mode more than once. So it works out. Make a 2-2 guy. Return target card from your graveyard to your hand. Proliferate, gain four life. So really, the thing that's great about these modal spells is you do whatever makes sense, right? Like if you need a board presence, you could very well pay seven mana to get four guys on the field, eight power. That's fine. If there's things in your grave you want to get back, sure. Proliferating, probably not super relevant for this deck. If you want, maybe want to hit the counters on Riku, sure. Uh, if you're at a low life, you could very casually just gain a quick 16. Um, that's the good thing about the deck is everything is situational and all of the cards let you adapt to those situations. Three visits, again, really just the same as nature's lore. Um, and then Titania's command, choose two. So again, you proc Riku twice. Exile target player's graveyard. You get um, one life for each card exiled this way, which is good. Search your deck for two lands. Put them into play tapped. Not basic lands, just two lands. Um, make two bears or put two 1-1 one -one counters on each creature you control. I never really do the first one, unless, like, I guess it's a graveyard deck or animator you're going against. Generally, I like searching for um, two lands, making the bears, and putting the counters. Uh, I don't really think, you know, putting the two counters, I think almost always you're either just doing two lands and bears or bears and counters. Uh, that's pretty much what you want to do, and it triggers you twice. Let's go into instance because we have a lot of them. A braid, you get to pick one. Deal three damage to target creature, destroy a target artifact. Arc Druid's Charm. Search your deck for a creature or land. Put it on the field if it's a land tapped. Or just put it in your hand if it's a creature. Which is good. Put a 1-1 counter on target creature you control. It essentially kills another creature. Or you exile an artifact or enchantment. Arc Mage's Charm. Blue, blue, blue. Counter target spell. Most likely you'll just draw two cards. Or you gain control of a token or a soul ring or whatever. You guys are going to notice that some of the spells in this deck are awkwardly costed. Because green, 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 and blue, blue, blue is very awkward for a three-color deck. But I'll show you the solution to them later. Artistic Refusal. It has Convoke. So the idea is, since we're already making a lot of tokens, because that's like what we want to do, and that's our win con anyway, it's going to be cheaper than four. Um, so we're going to counter a spell. And, because again, what it's one or both, we want to do both, ideally. And draw two cards and then discard a card. So essentially the way I look at it for two mana, that's not bad. Um, even if it's three, that's still fine. Um, Tarkus Command, two mana, choose two. Your opponents can't gain life, which is actually low-key kind of big, right? Um, deal three damage to each opponent. Put a land card from your field onto the battlefield. From your hand onto the battlefield. Oh my god. And then creatures you control get plus one, plus oh, and gain reach until end of turn. It's a combat trick. It's ramp. It's bolting your opponents to the face and making your opponents not gain life can be pretty huge if you're going against like an olaro or a life gain deck this card could be pretty big if your opponent's having a huge turn confounding riddle is either just a counter spell or you dig four put one that you like in your hand the rest on the bottom and again all of these cards for everyone you see that choose one or both or choose two or choose one is an additional trigger for riku right so it's never just like oh yeah like i'm just countering a spell it's like you're countering a spell and you're getting a guy or you're making your commander bigger or you're essentially drawing a card for next turn it's great cryptic command awkward spell choose to counter target spell return target permanent to its owner's hand tap all creatures your opponents control or draw a card the way i look at this and again it's awkward because you can't really look at it in any big particular way uh because it's all modal and everything's situational and that's why this deck in my opinion is very powerful you can counter spell if you want. You can bounce something. I like the idea of tapping all creatures in opponent's controls and then countering a spell or just drawing a card just because um, you can beat in on your turn. You can have your opponents attack a player who essentially is tapped out, so that's even more damage. Psych Rift, it's a costly spell, but we're a spell deck, so 
I feel like seven's not super unachievable, especially we have a lot of ramp, so we should be fine. Drown in G Dreams. Choose your commander. If you control a commander, you can choose both. We probably will do both because we can draw a bunch of cards or we can have someone mill a bunch of cards. We're really only just going to draw the cards and the mill is just kind of like something something nice if someone's just like, oh, I'm playing Soldier Tribal or whatever. It's like, oh, you can mill a bunch and you're probably not going to get them back. Flame of Anor or Anor. I don't know. Choose one. If you control a wizard, like I literally think, guys, there's only five non-wizards or shamans in the deck. So... Yeah, you know, well, I mean, a third of the deck's wizards, right? A third of the creature's wizards. Our commander is a wizard. Uh, so most likely we can do both, which is then, or choose two, which will then also proc off Riku. Draw two cards, most likely to kill a creature or pop an artifact. Either way, real good. Great Train Heist. This is the first Spree card. And I do want to say with Spree, it is awkward because I want to say you can't choose none. You have to choose one or more. So you can't just say like, ah, oh, it's a red, it does nothing, right? You can't. So you have to pick one. Either way, it's great options. On tap all creatures, there's an additional combat phase, which is great because we want to beat down with our tokens, make our tokens even bigger, which is also great, and have like and then choose an opponent, and then whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to that player, you make a tapped treasure. So a lot of good things all at once. I highly doubt we're gonna get what is that one, four, five, six, seven. We're probably not tapping out for seven on that, but if we can, that's pretty that's pretty huge. Um, but again, you do whatever makes sense. Gruel Charm. I mainly like the idea of creatures without flying can't block this turn because most creatures do not fly. So basically your opponent's creatures can't block. You can also hose flyers because we like we make flyers. Riku makes flying birds, um, which is good. Or if someone's stealing your stuff, just get it back. Inscription of Abundance is great just because you choose one. And then if it's kicked, you do all of it. So... I like just five mana is good. I actually like this card in Brawl too. I play it in Historic Brawl on Arena. Um, but for five mana, putting two 1-1 one -one counters on our biggest guy and then gaining life equal to Riku, which is probably our biggest creature, and then having that creature then kill something else is great. Is it Charm? Again, you pick what you need. Counter a non-creature unless they pay two. Deals two damage to target creature. Draw two and then discard two. A lot of options, right? A lot of options. Mystic Confluence is really good too. Uh, five mana, choose three, and you can choose one mode more than twice. Counter a spell, unless they pay three, bounce a creature, draw a card. The way I look at this, generally through my experience playing with this card, is it's counter, draw, draw. Um, that's the best way I do it because you're not, if I can, like, you probably don't want to, unless you really need to make an opponent pay nine to counter a spell you're probably just going to want to draw two cards rather than bouncing a creature. It also is a great way to get rid of a creature too. You really do whatever you need with it. You can just bounce three creatures and then just essentially make your opponent skip a combat, which is cool. Even five mana draw three at instant speed, eh, it's fine. Prismari Charm. You choose two, prox Riku twice. You guys already know it. Deal two damage to any target, draw two, discard two. Uh, you make a treasure or you pop an artifact. I kind of like the idea of just making an artifact or making a treasure and then drawing two and discarding two. It's really good early game like that. Quandrix Charm. Return target creature or planeswalker to a turner hand. You bounce it. You counter an artifact or enchantment. Put two 1-1 one -one counters on a creature or target player shuffles up to three cards from their graveyard into their library. Which is good if you're dealing with reanimation. Again, you make a guy bigger. You bounce a creature. You counter an artifact or enchantment. Lots of good stuff. Return of the Wild Speaker can it's good in both ways right do either riku is a human so you're probably not doing the draw i do like the idea of non-human creatures which is pretty much all of our tokens getting plus three plus three that's like another pseudo kill spell or even just drawing a handful of cards for our non-humans um that's fine too but i like it really just as a pump spell return to nature destroy target artifact enchantment or exile target card from a graveyard you do what makes sense. That's pretty much what I'm going to say for the rest of the video, but you really do what makes sense in the situation. Exile target card isn't huge. If someone wants to reanimate it, that's when it's big. You can just easy two mana, get rid of it, and then you get a proc off Riku. Um, but you do what makes sense. Reverse the polarity. Counter all other spells. So if someone's going nuts with a spell slinging deck, you get rid of all of it. Switch each creature's power and um, toughness until end of turn. It's awkward. I guess it kind of like can goozle your opponents if they have like zero fives or whatever. Like Arcades decks cry when they see this card. Um, 
or creatures just can't be blocked, which is also still pretty good. C double, the card can't be copied. Um, you choose one of them though. If an opponent has eight or more cards in their graveyard, which is pretty likely, uh, you can choose both, which is just copy target spell. Um, you may choose a new target for the copy, which is good. Um, so if someone has a good permanent they're casting, we can just have it. And we can also just create a token that's a copy of target creature. So the way I like this is you cast it while something's on the stack, right? You just get whatever they're casting or you change it up. Again, it, it's, it's, it's hard to explain things going on in this deck because everything is so situational, right? But either way, you take your opponent's spell, you either get a copy of it or you just... You, you really get a copy of it and you do whatever makes sense or you get the best creature on the field and you have a token of it which is also good simic charm target creature gets plus three plus three until end of turn permanence you control gain hexproof return target creature so i don't really think that i mean they're all pretty good if you want to try and win with commander damage with riku it's still very possible you're essentially giving them plus four plus four and trample until end of turn if someone tries to kill some of your stuff it's kind of like a bad heroic intervention. It's actually a terrible heroic intervention. But if someone has a kill spell, you know, eh, whatever. It's hexproof. It's fine. Or you just bounce a creature you don't like. Smuggler Surprise. Spree. I'm, I'm getting used to Spree. <laughs> I, I, it's okay. I like it. Uh, you mill four cards. Put two creatures or land cards from the milled cards into your hand. Um, return two creature cards. Or sorry, put two creature cards from your hand onto the battlefield. Or creatures you control power four or greater gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. You can kind of goozle someone with this, right? The, I, I mean, everything in the ideal for these spree cards is you do everything. But I think even just being a realistic, like, ah, oh, Riku gains hexproof and indestructible for two mana is fine. Uh, land ramping is fine. Or if you just want to whip two guys into play for, like, six mana, that's also okay sublime epiphany oh i guess that's oh, i guess five is bigger than um planner celebration yeah five i mean yeah anyway riku can't copy all of them either way counter a spell you pretty much do everything you can so a spell's on the stack right you counter it counter target activated or triggered ability which you could also use as a counter spell if someone's ulting a planeswalker or luckily um let's say someone has an effect from casting that spell like very often we get a creature token from casting a spell so let's assume someone gets a creature token from casting a spell. You counter that spell. You counter the generation of the creature. You bounce something you don't like. You make a copy of the best thing you have, and then you draw a card. Pretty good. Tamer Charm. Target creature you control gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. It fights a creature you control, which is essentially a kill spell. That's how you have to read that. You counter target spell, unless its controller pays three, so it's like a mana leak. And then creatures with power three or less can't block this turn which is also pretty good. So that means token decks generally can't do much about it. Like they're pseudo unblockable spells, you know. Three steps ahead. Counter a spell, make a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control, and then draw two and discard a card. Do what makes sense. Again, I'm going to keep saying you do what makes sense. Going into our artifacts, this is it. It's really just ramp. Um, it's weird to put artifacts in the deck for the spell singing other than ramp when all of our spells do everything, our artifacts like everything we would want our artifacts to do so it's weird going into enchantment arcane bombardment is a huge deal it can straight up win this the game whenever you cast your first instant or sorcery each turn exile an instant or sorcery at random from your graveyard then copy each card exiled with arcane bombardment you may cast any number of copies without paying their mana cost so you're basically every time you cast a spell you're going to copy every other spell under it which again since they're modal spells you do it makes sense you know like oh i'll draw cards or i'll make a copy of this thing or i'll bounce that creature or whatever right i'll get a land to the field a million different options uh ristic study you know you know it you hate it uh it's just card draw for us really shark typhoon whenever we cast a non-creature we make a big shark um with flying which is good and then we can cycle it in a pinch to make a token and draw a card thousand year storm whenever you cast an instant or sorcery copy it for each other instant and sorcery you cast before it. this turn you may choose new targets for the copies that's pretty good because it basically it's like okay it really gives all of our spells storm essentially that's really all thousand year storm does it's in the name um so even if we're just like three visiting later and we cast like two other spells this turn it's like okay i guess we'll get three forests to the field untapped um and then it just goes on more and more 
And then finally, for the enchantments, we have Wilderness Reclamation, which is just at the beginning of your end step, untap all lands you control. Um, we just we just want to be able to play instants on our opponent's turn. That's pretty much it with Wilderness Reclamation, is we don't want to have to worry about being tapped down during our, like, we want to play the creatures on our turn while also having the reassurance that cards like Wilderness Reclamation is going to untap all of our lands on our end step so we can keep up protection and that Seaborn Muse is going to do the same. It's, it's good. Going into lands, we have all the shock lands, and I want to talk about these lands. See, this is the filter lands. I mentioned earlier in the video that we have some cards in the deck that are awkward to cast because they're multiple colors, where it's Archmage Charm, Archdruid's Charm, Cryptic Command, whatever, where they're like blue, 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 green, green, green. I think filter lands are a good option, right? Just because we can be like, okay, well, we can turn our mountain into blue, blue. We can turn our forest into green, green, or blue, blue, like whatever, right? It just helps us filter through it. We're not losing any mana. We're we're not gaining any. We're, it's gaining mana. It's just it's filtering it for two, which I think is good. We're running all the check lands. We're running all the battle bot lands because I enter untapped, and then just for the other lands, we're running Ketria Triome, um, just because it's probably what we're going to tutor with Frontier Bivouac because it's worst Ketria Triome Command Tower enters untapped. I did that backwards, and then the final unique land or non basic land is just Reliquary Tower. Um, just because we draw a lot of cards and that's kind of it going into the other ones uh we're really just i didn't add that i didn't add that to the video that's fine we're running seven of each pretty much so it's like 35 lands again thank you guys for watching get the cards you need from the link down below remember to add counts for your lands when you make a youtube video like comment subscribe and i'll see you next time